Welcome back to the class Computational Neuroscience, Neuronal Dynamics of Cognition. This week we look at decision models and I would like now to give you some background about perceptual decision making. Suppose you see three bars on a screen. Now the middle bar is not exactly in the middle but it's shifted slightly to the right or to the left. I want you to take the decision. Do you see it shifted to the left or to the, to the right? And I want you to make a commitment. If you see to the left, you put your left hand on your knee. If you see it shifted to the right, you put your right hand on your right knee. Okay? Make your decision now. Here's another example. Make your decision now. A third example. Make your decision now. And a fourth example. Make your decision now. Now, it's important in these experiments that you're actually forced to take a decision. You cannot say, I don't know. You are forced to take a decision, either left or right. That's the setup of these experiments, and you see from these examples that you can make it quite difficult so that there's a certain amount of noise attached to the decision-making. Now, decision-making involves many, many different areas, and in experiments with monkeys, you can also ask whether they would vote left or right, and they do this by moving their eyes, by performing a saccade. And one of the standard stimuli used is not the bisection task, but it's a moving dot task. So there, there's a random configuration of dots presented on the screens, and these dots move coherently in one direction or the other. And if they move left, the monkey has to say left. If they move right, the monkey has to say right by moving his eye, by shifting his direction of gaze. Now, in this kind of decision task, different areas involved, the visual input comes in to different visual areas, first in visual cortex V1, V2, V3, that would be, the, uh, that would be different processing stages. For motion detection, an important area is the area V5, also called MT. And this is the area here from which recordings have been done in this first set of experiments. So an electrode has been put into this area so that it records activity from one or just a few of the neurons in this area. And now while you hold your electrode, you present on the screen different moving dot parts paradigms. For example, as you try with a set of moving dots, moving to the right, and you see that your cell, the one cell you are recording from, has very little activity. Then you turn the angle of movement, you make the movement, for example, moving in this direction, nearly perpendicular upwards, and now you find you have a very strong response. You can turn it even further so that the dots move to the left, and then you would find the activity goes down again. So as a result of this kind of experiment, you can say this one cell that you are recording from has a preferred direction of movement of, say, here, 130 or 140 degree. So different cells will have different preferred movement directions. And as a first step, you always find out what is the preferred direction of movement of the cell you are recording from. So, the first statement, therefore, is the receptive field is sensitive to the direction of motion. The second statement is the receptive field is still spatially localized. And now you can play with different stimuli. Once you have found that your cell responds best to movement in this direction, and once you have found where its localization is, you can now say, I can use a moving dot stimulus where 100% move in the same direction, or you can say, I move a stimulus where only 66% of the moving dots move in the same directions, while all the others move in arbitrary random directions. Now, the task is designed such that if the monkey discovers that the movement is in this direction, then he should shift his gaze to the point P, which corresponds to LED. Now, if the monkey 
perceives movement in a different direction, he should shift his gaze and make a saccade to the neutral point N. So P for preferred direction, N for a neutral point. So the setup of the experiment is as follows. The monkey has to focus throughout the experiments on the fixation point. So the fixation point comes up. This is the first phase of the experiment. Then in the second phase of the experiment, the stimuli go on. So this is now the visual stimulus. Now we have a moving dot paradigm and the fixation point is still on while the visual stimulus is on. Then the visual stimulus turns off and the two LEDs will go on. And this is the moment when the monkey, and he can shift his gaze to the direction he would choose. And for example, if he perceives this movement as moving to the left upwards, then he would probably move his eye to this LED here. So in the end, the eye position is the readout. That's the indication of a decision. So the monkey indicates his decision by eye movement. And just as we humans could make the task difficult for us, in the case of a visual bisection task, we have to say whether the middle bar is shifted to the left or to the right, we can make the task difficult for the monkey by having only 80% of the dots moving together, or 50% of the dots, or 10%, or 0%, or even moving dots in the other direction. And now what you find is that the monkey chooses the movement towards the preferred direction. Say he chooses the direction P. And what I indicate is the percentage of time that he chooses P. Now, if I give a strong stimulus where all points move in the same direction, the monkey is pretty sure to give always the same answer. If I have a completely random movement of dots, then since the monkey is forced to make a decision, he will say in 50% of the cases to the left, 50% in the, of the cases to the right. Now, more interesting are cases like when only 10% of the dots move in the same direction, in which case the monkey will take a decision which is stochastic, so that, for example, in 60% of the cases he would say P, and in the other 40% he would say N. And of course, all of these points would have a error attached to it. So overall, we have a curve like this. And this curve just represents the behavioral performance of the monkey, the decision of the monkey. Just as in our psychophysical experiment at the beginning of this part, when I asked you to say whether the middle bar was shifted to the left or to the right. It's a pure behavioral performance curve. But now I told you that these experiments are done while the experimentalist is recording from one of the neurons. And we know that the, the preferred direction of this neuron we are recording from is, for example, this direction towards the point P. So what we can do now is we can exploit that if a neuron sits in this area MT, it's not isolated in the sense that neighboring neurons will do very similar stuff. So if one neuron has a preferred direction in, in this direction, then neighboring neurons will often have similar preferred directions of movements. Now the experimentalist can apply a stimulus while the task is running, and this stimulus will slightly excite neurons in the direct neighborhood of the electrode. And then we can redo the task with different levels of coherence. And what we see is that with stimulation, the original curve is now shifted further upwards. That means even at zero coherence, the monkey no longer is at 50%, but he will preferably indicate that he perceives a movement towards the direction P, the preferred direction of the cells we are recording from. So, we can influence the decision, but does this mean that this area is taking the decision? No, that's not the case. 
Rather, this area represents the perception, and I can influence the perception by changing the perceived stimulus. And I can change this perceived stimulus by giving extra excitation. So, having a higher activity of these neurons in this area indicates that the monkey perceives a movement in the preferred direction where, in fact, it's just random dots. Now, this area, MT, that we talked about so far, is just one step on the processing way. The next stage would be LIP, and then this is the frontal eye field area, which is very close to controlling the saccade. Now, let's look at the activity of these LIP neurons. LIP neurons still have a receptive field, but the receptive field is now a rather abstract concept. It doesn't say where the stimulus is, but rather the receptive field of a neuron in LIP is selective to the target of the saccade. For example, the neuron that Reutemann and Chatelain have been recording from was, sen was sensitive to the fact that the monkey prepared a movement of a saccade he prepared the eye movement in this direction. So, the preparation of a movement in this direction is being indicated by neurons in LRP, by this neuron in LRP, which has a receptive field here. Of course, there would be another neuron somewhere else in, in the LRP that would maybe have a receptive field over there, and this other neuron would go on if the monkey prepares a movement in the other direction. So, overall, the experiment runs as before. The monkey has to fixate, he has two targets, and based on the motion stimulus he perceives, he has to indicate his choice, his perception, by moving his eye either towards the right position or towards the left position. And now, here are the results. This is a neuron that had a receptive field for indicating preparation of movement in this direction. And now the data is organized according to the moment when the saccade was initiated, which means the moment when the eye movement started, when the eye movement was measurable. Now these are different trials. Each line is one experiment. It's always the same neuron and the trials have been sorted that the motion stimulus started at different moments. So this was a trial where the motion stimulus started here and the monkey took quite a bit of time until the saccade started and this was a trial where the monkey responded rather quickly to the motion stimulus. Now all of these stimuli were fairly strong, about 50% of the points were moving in the same direction. If you use a weaker stimulus then the overall decision time is much longer. Now sometimes random dots were presented as moving in the other direction, in which case the monkey had to indicate a choice over here. Nevertheless, the recording was made from the same neuron as before. And now, while the monkey makes the movement or prepares the movement to the left, the activity of neurons that would indicate movement to the right is slightly suppressed. There's slightly less activity than on the other side. So neurons in LRP are selective to the target of the saccade and their response increases faster for stronger stimuli than for weaker stimuli and there's a weak suppression effect if the movement goes away from, this, from the selected socket, from the, from the selected receptive field. So let me summarize. Neurons in LRP, they are selective to the target of the saccade the activity increases faster for a stronger signal. The activity is very noisy. Now, these LIP neurons are located somewhere in the signal processing stream between the sensory areas and the saccade control. So, I, in no way I would claim that these neurons take the decision. But there's an interesting correlation between the decision outcome and the activity of neurons in LIP. So, before we go on, just one question of quiz. Please take your time. 